This video is sponsored by Describe. Last year I made a video about wrapping your mind around the subject of spell slots and Vancian magic, which is the magic system D&D uses. If you haven't watched it because you're new to my channel, go back and check it out. It's pretty good. But there's another big part of D&D, and honestly many tabletop role-playing games, that can be a bit difficult to reconcile, especially through the lens of games like 5th edition D&D. And that's the question of hit points and armor class. Look, first of all, we all know why hit points exist as a mechanic. We want a way to represent the health of an adventurer, and more specifically, how much damage you can take before you die. Because damage and death are usually a pretty big deal in any action story, and RPGs are no different. But of course, we also sometimes wonder how a player character can survive some of the things that get thrown their way. I'm reminded of this Brian David Gilbert quote about the origin of the term hit points. Back in the 1920s, the Naval War College created an early form of this in order to help evaluate battles before actually fighting them. They had a stat called life, which was determined by how many 14-inch shell hits a vessel could take. So that's what a hit point is. How many 14-inch shells it would take to kill you. Every living creature is one hit point. The end. But as he goes on to point out in his very good video, this definition of hit points had to be adjusted when gamers started playing games like D&D, and started playing out battles with individual characters instead of full armies. Which means hit points are just a further abstraction of a larger concept. But what exactly do they represent? Do they map well onto our understanding of how the human body works? And ultimately, how does this question actually inform the style of your game? Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that the 5e rules state that hit points represent a combination of physical and mental durability, the will to live, and luck. Now that's a pretty broad definition and doesn't give us a lot to work with. Or does it? Well, let's start with that last word, luck. One kind of common interpretation in online spaces is the idea that hit points don't actually represent damage taken during a fight. If it did, then it stands to reason player characters would be mutilated beyond all recognition from all the hits they've taken and somehow survived. Adventurers would be 90% scar tissue. Instead, some tables consider that hit points essentially represent not getting hit. They instead represent luck or fortune, or just agility and dexterity. So when a player character is dropped to zero hit points by an attack, that's the one attack that hit. Every other attack missed, but reduced the player's luck or stamina to avoid that strike. For an example, let's look at the fight between Brienne of Tarth and Arya from Game of Thrones. Matt Colville, my new best friend, once tweeted about this fight several years ago and used it as an example of this concept in action, the idea that hit points equal luck. In this scene, when Brienne swings and Arya dips out of the way, he argues that this would be represented in D&D as Arya burning some of her HP to specifically avoid getting hit. And apparently this is the intended interpretation of hit points in the early editions of the game, per Again, someone in Matt Colville's replies on that thread. And in theory, it makes sense. After all, the stamina required to stay on your feet during an exhausting fight could account for how your hit points are determined by your constitution. And of course, if you're running a game where you want it to seem unrealistic that someone can take a hit from a dragon's breath or a dinosaur's bite and keep going in the fight, then yeah, I understand the appeal. It's the same mentality that lines up with something like the OSR, which I'm sure we're going to talk about another day. But when you're trying to reconcile how 5e handles hit points, this answer doesn't really work for me. From my perspective, dodging out of the way of an attack seems like it would be based less on your constitution and more on your dexterity, which is why something like that I feel will be better covered under your armor class. When someone misses an attack in a D&D encounter, I'm usually very clear to describe that if the roll was low enough or the target doesn't wear a lot of armor, they're avoiding the blow by dodging out of the way. If the roll was very close to hitting, and especially if the target has decent armor or a shield, I'll describe them blocking the hit and knocking the weapon away. If the target is a villain and I'm trying to make them seem like a badass, I'll describe how they block the attack with their own weapon and they lock blades with the player character, staring into their eyes and smiling. Something like that. However, I don't think that approach would work if I used it to describe damage. If I say something like, you swing your blade and the orc warboss rolls out of the way, roll for damage. I think that's going to be pretty confusing. Wait, you said I missed? No, you hit. But he rolled out of the way. Right, just narratively. Well, then how is it different than if I had just missed? And so on, you understand. Now one workaround to that issue is to not use this approach for monsters and enemies, but just to use it when describing attacks against the heroes. After all, it doesn't matter if your villains recover from a bunch of intense attacks they wouldn't really be able to survive, because 
Villains and monsters aren't likely to have a life expectancy longer than 10 rounds, and if they do survive an intense attack and they retreat, they can bear the evidence of the fight in some form of badass scars. Not only will that make the villain more imposing, it will also remind the players of their prior encounter. So again, it really seems like the question of what hit points represents only becomes an issue when discussing how much damage player characters are able to take. But again, even in that context, I just don't find this approach to be a satisfying solution. And my other reason for that is because, well, some attacks deal different types of damage. If someone is resistant to piercing damage but vulnerable to bludgeoning damage, then why does that matter if the narrative explanation is that the target dodged the attack? Or let's say someone gets hit with a stinger, and they take piercing damage and poison damage. If the justification for hit points is that sometimes you don't get hit until one big attack knocks you unconscious, then the difference in these sorts of damage types doesn't actually matter. If your rationalization for hit points is that the character is successfully dodging the attacks but losing energy or luck while doing so, then why bother distinguishing between bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing damage, let alone cold or fire or acid or thunder or lightning? Again, this might not bother you. After all, it's all an abstraction anyway, so really, who cares? But that's just why it doesn't line up for me. So the way I explain it instead is that, yeah, you did get hit. Physically, something struck you, and now you have to shake that off and keep fighting. And now's the part where I tell you that all of this actually has to do with how you approach your game and how you describe the mood and the details of your encounters. Well, actually now is the part where I cut to an ad, but after that, we're going to talk about the stuff I just said. Enjoy the advertisement. And now, a word from our sponsor. Welcome to Great Moments in D&D History, presented by Artivist Gleam. Episode 4, The Gorgon. For decades, Dungeons & Dragons players who were also familiar with Greek mythology have scratched their heads at the game's description of the Gorgon. While the Gorgons of Greek myth were usually a set of sisters with snakes for hair and the ability to turn those who behold them into stone, the Gorgon of Dungeons & Dragons was instead a metal bull whose stomach was filled with poisonous gas, even more so than most cow stomachs. Some have speculated that Gary Gygax modeled his Gorgon after the strange Libyan beast from Edward Topsell's 1607 zoological text, The History of Four-Footed Beasts, since the Libyan beast is also described as an ox-like creature with poisonous breath. However, this text was pretty difficult to pass, and it seems clear that Gary Gygax would have needed a great deal of help translating this lore into an understandable description that he could use in his game. Of course, this researcher believes Gary Gygax possessed a time machine and was able to seek assistance from today's sponsor, Describe. The sages at Describe provide pre-written texts that you can use at your tables to describe monsters, magic items, spells, locations, and characters. And they don't just offer more than 7,000 scenes on their website, they're constantly creating new descriptions based on your submissions. Which of course, is what Gary Gygax did when he created a Describe account and copy-pasted the Libyan Beast text from Edward Topsell's book, a thing he absolutely did. If you visit Describe.com slash SuperGeek and use the promo code SuperGeek at checkout, you can save 10% off of your first subscription payment, which is also something Gary Gygax did through the benefit of time travel. Thus ends our fourth episode of Great Moments in D&D History, presented by Artivist Gleam. Once again, that's DSCRYB.com slash SuperGeek, and make sure to use the promo code SuperGeek. My descriptions of damage definitely line up more with the will-to-live definition of hit points. From my perspective, when you're describing a battle where player characters can take multiple hits and keep fighting, you kind of need to play by Indiana Jones rules. Because, yes, these characters are going to take some punishment. But unless they take enough damage to knock them down, it's going to be a superficial injury. It's going to be minor enough that they can shake it off. Sure, it might take the wind out of them, it might even stagger them or bloody them, God, I miss the bloodied condition from 4th edition. But unless it's a hit that actually takes them down, then I'll describe it as something that isn't necessarily lethal. The crossbow bolt hits you in the shoulder and sticks right through. Because you can describe things that way, and hopefully your group can still accept the premise that your player characters are still able to fight. I'm thinking particularly of an episode of Firefly, where the first thing that happened in the fight was that somebody threw a hooked blade into Mal's shoulder. And yeah, he kept fighting. It sucked for him, he had to get patched up later, and he probably spent the rest of the day favoring that shoulder, but we as the audience don't assume he's going to die from that hit. Now, 
One of the ways I justify this approach to damage is I don't worry about asking players to describe specific scars they might take unless an attack is powerful enough to knock them unconscious. If an attack drops the hero to zero hit points, then when they get healed, they're still going to have a physical scar on their body. Now, I don't care what that scar ultimately looks like, if it's visible on exposed skin or easily covered by their clothes or their armor, that's all up to the player's discretion. But that scar becomes part of their character. And it's my way of saying, this damage is going to leave an impact, and no magical healing is going to properly remove the reminder of that fight. Of course, this gets into the topic of how magical healing works, but honestly, how you describe magical healing is determined by how you describe damage. Since I don't worry about describing how most battle impacts would leave scars, my interpretation of magical healing is that it just speeds up the healing process and leaves no impact, besides the scars left by dropping to zero hit points. Because otherwise, if the damage is more severe, with broken bones and the like, then the players need magical healing, or lots of time, to deal with those injuries. And that doesn't line up with 5e's approach to natural healing, where you regain all of your hit points at the end of a long rest. Whether you like that approach to hit points or not is sort of a separate topic, and we'll come back to that. Right now, we're just trying to find ways to rationalize 5e's approach to damage. And obviously, only describing players getting scarred up by dropping unconscious is just my approach to damage. You might feel differently. You might still not want to describe the PCs getting scarred with every single hit, but maybe only doing so on those final hits that knock them unconscious doesn't feel dramatic enough or realistic enough. Maybe a nice compromise is that the character will get a scar whenever a hit is powerful enough to take them below half of their hit points. Which, by the way, was the bloodied condition from 4e, and a bunch of awesome stuff happened when people were bloodied. Y'all slept on 4th edition, there was some good stuff going on there. In our Curse of Strahd game, the entire group got hit by a lightning bolt spell and almost all of them got knocked unconscious. So they all agreed that they had these scars that the kind that people get when they get struck by lightning. Some characters had the scar on their arm, others had them on their neck or their chest. It was totally up to the players. And then when the moment presents itself, or I'm given a dramatic opportunity to do so, I'll include a reference to the scar when it would be visible or noteworthy to mention. And when I do so, it effectively reminds the players of what their characters have been through. If I've done a good job of asking them to describe their war wounds after a fight, which I don't always do, but let's pretend I always remember to do this, then whenever the scar is referenced again, it will serve to remind them about that fight. And doing so might actually impact their tactics as they're reminded of their failures or their close calls. Now, I referenced Indiana Jones as a touchstone for this interpretation of hit points, but that's very much a pulp story. The punches make big, dramatic, kind of goofy sounds, so of course we aren't surprised when Indiana Jones doesn't get brutally scarred in battle. But if you want to run a more dramatic, grittier game, then you might feel that this approach is incompatible with that style. And it's possible it might still not work for you, but I do think it can. And my example is the Netflix Daredevil show. Matt Murdock gets hit a lot on that show. He gets punched many, many times. In one fight, he got the stuffing kicked out of him, he got stabbed, and he did not die from those wounds. In a lot of cases, he didn't even get any specific scars that the makeup department had to track from season to season. Most often, we just saw some blood trailing out of his mouth during the fight. In the next scene, he'd be covered in bruises and bandages. And then the next time Charlie Cox did a shirtless scene, he just had this vague network of scars on his body. And that's totally fine. In most of these cases, we don't question how Daredevil can then go out and punch people some more the next day. We accept the premise that he's pushing himself beyond what's healthy for a human being, and doing something that he physically should not be doing to himself. I'd argue the reason that first hallway fight works as well as it does is because it's selling us on the idea that he's taxing his body a lot, but his sheer force of will is keeping him in the fight. But of course, in the context of the world as presented, this is a superhero story, and we know he can take a lot of punishment and then keep fighting. And arguably, that's also true about a game like 5th edition. And this is where we have to address a pretty pivotal question. How much do you want your characters to feel like superheroes instead of regular people? Let's look at Game of Thrones again. In Season 1, Ned Stark gets hit in the leg with a spear, and he's down. He's out. The fight is over. Every other strike in the fight was something he avoided, and arguably cost him some stamina, but that was the hit that landed. That's kind of why it would be a challenge to transplant a story like early Game of Thrones to a system like 5e, because they have very different approaches to the role damage takes in storytelling. The later seasons, however, are full of characters taking a surprising amount of abuse and being able to walk it off relatively unscathed, and that approach actually lends itself much better to a game like 5e. 
Now you can make the case that this shift represents the characters leveling up, that the reason a single strike can take down a character in Season 1 is because they're just lower level at that point. You can argue that the gradual escalation of stakes in Game of Thrones lines up with the escalation of 5e's leveling system. And again, that might be a satisfying answer to you. But even at low levels, it feels to me like the way 5e handles hit points just doesn't jive with how much damage and healing matters in the early seasons of Game of Thrones. When the later seasons become an adventure fantasy show, that version of the world presented actually seems to line up more with 5e's assumptions about damage. Now, there's another key factor to consider. Depictions of damage just hit different, no pun intended, when you're looking at actual actors or reading about the character's exploits in a book versus when you're playing them in a role-playing game. In a game, there's really no author there to determine the most dramatically appropriate moment for a character to get hit with a powerful attack that knocks them unconscious or kills them. That's all decided entirely by the dice. So, in part because no one person can predict exactly when and how the characters will take damage, we treat hit points as an approximation. In my games, I like to explain them by saying that the characters will be able to shake off these attacks no matter what weapon they're being dealt with. Yes, realistically, if a goblin in a cave with a rusty knife stabs you, that wound would certainly get infected. And if you want to include that sort of mechanic in your games, you're welcome to do so. But I do think it's worth considering what that means, and what message you're sending to your players. If you establish that even a simple dagger strike can lead to a lethal infection, you're telling the players that they are not heroes. They're fragile people. So aside from just the logistics of whether or not hit points represent damage versus dodging, and how different types of damage would or wouldn't play a role in that, let's set all of that aside. Instead, really think about what it means if you're telling your players that they can't take a hit. Functionally, it's very much like telling them that they're all glass cannons. The first time they get hit, they get knocked out, or disarmed, or even killed. Sure, that makes perfect sense for wizards, but why should the barbarian not just be fully taking arrows to the chest? Why shouldn't they feel kind of like the Hulk. Why can't they have that cool moment of taking a dagger in the shoulder, looking down at it and saying, <laughs> tickles. You're kind of taking away the opportunity for your players to have that cool moment, which might be why they rolled up a character with that specific class. Now, again, if you hear everyone can only take a hit or two and then they're gonna drop and get really excited about the storytelling implications, then it's possible you might just not love 5e's approach to damage in general, regardless of how it's explained or justified. You might actually really enjoy something that's more like the OSR, where the games are much more brutal and lethal. But when I play 5e, those cool moments of certain characters being able to take a lot of damage and shrug it off jives really well with what my players enjoy about that game specifically. And lots of different games have lots of different approaches. In Monster of the Week, everyone always has the same number of hit points, and the only way to avoid damage you take is to spend luck, which is a resource you can gradually run low on or run out of. Masks A New Generation is a game that models teen superhero stories like Teen Titans or Young Justice, where it matters less if the characters take physical damage, and more if they suffer... well... EMOTIONAL DAMAGE! Things that happen to the young heroes during the game have an impact on the characters' personalities and moods. You lose your connection with humanity and think of yourself more as a monster, or your bonds with your friends are damaged and you start considering yourself a loner. The character sheets feature sliding scales to represent the emotional trauma you've taken, and when enough of those sliders hit certain thresholds, you're incapacitated and someone needs to take a minute in the middle of a fight and try to get through to you, saying exactly what you need to hear to pull you out of your funk. And that's a really interesting way to approach damage where hit points don't enter into it at all. Now, in a game like 5e, you don't have that same clear narrative approach to how the combat and the damage works, which is why we're having this discussion. Maybe you prefer hit points to work like damage taken by Characters like John McClane or Indiana Jones, where you do take actual, literal, physical wounds, but you're just able to patch yourself up and push on. Or maybe the armor blocks the impact, but the characters are still getting bruised by each hit. That's another good middle ground, because especially, it can line up with the fact that you weren't able to dodge the attack. Plus, each hit you take could realistically slow you down and get you winded. But of course, here's the other wrinkle with 5e's approach to hit points. You're not actually any worse at fighting when you have one hit point, versus when you have 90 hit points. None of your powers change. This isn't even 4th edition, where you get a power up or a different status when you become bloodied at half your hit points. In a way, it's purely cosmetic. And that's actually a great argument for the approach where that one hit that knocks you unconscious is the one hit that actually landed. Again, I do fully understand where that approach is coming from. 
But that's why I describe the impact that takes a player down as being a really significant one, one that hits the player character in a vital area. Now, maybe you don't want to describe a PC taking an arrow to the sternum or a crossbow bolt to the neck, because while it does lead to a cinematic moment where they might bleed out... Message for you, son. It doesn't really make any sense that they'd be able to get back up if they succeeded on their death-saving throws. I, I, I think I, I could pull through, sir. That's why I like to describe impacts to the shoulder or the leg or even the gut. Sometimes I'll describe a wound to the neck. If they fail their death saving throws, then maybe the arrow hit an artery. If they succeed, then they got grazed and lost some blood, but didn't really bleed out. Is that really any more realistic? I don't know, probably not, but it tends to work for my games. That's why I say that how you think of hit points says a lot about the style of your campaigns. For the Daredevil approach, characters can take a lot of punishment and keep pushing through. But that might not be the right approach for your table, and that's certainly not how every RPG handles damage. And honestly, at higher levels of 5th edition is where I start to wonder how these characters are able to survive some of what happens to them, but everyone is realistically going to have their own threshold for what does and doesn't make sense in the world of the game. Like, I once played a character who fully got hit in the face with a flying pirate ship that crashed into the ground, and then on my next turn, my wizard picked himself up and kept fighting. Because I was 17th level, I could handle something like that. I also dumped a lot of my ability score improvements into Constitution. He was a pretty hardy character, but that's kind of not the point. It's possible there will be moments in your games where you need to tell your players, I don't care about the damage rules in this moment. If you fail this save, you're going to die. Because there's no way an adventurer could actually survive a 600-foot fall into rocks or be hit in the face with a sailing frigate. But no matter what the circumstances, if you feel the need to change the rules around damage or even just suspend them for a single moment, communicate with your players first. Make sure everyone knows how this is going to work. And don't be afraid to invoke examples from pop culture. If you say, I want damage to matter like it does in early Game of Thrones, that paints a very different picture than invoking something like the Hobbit movies. Because, you know, you know people survive a lot of things that they shouldn't really be able to, to do in those Hobbit movies. I just made myself sad thinking about the Hobbit movie, so that feels like a good place to end the video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this discussion on this topic, and if you did, there are a few ways you can support the channel. You can subscribe and ring the bell so you can get reminders and notifications whenever a new video comes out. I drop new videos every Monday and Thursday. You can support me financially by joining my Patreon. Every new patron at any dollar amount really helps the channel a lot. You can join my Discord community to hang out with other awesome people who can offer their own perspectives. I'm sure this topic will lead to some excellent, interesting conversations about how damage does and doesn't work in RPGs. And the fourth way to support the channel is by signing up for my newsletter so you can get occasional updates about the important things I've got going on. Since we are talking about game mechanics that don't necessarily make a ton of sense, you should check out my recent video on the terrible chase rules from the Dungeon Master's Guide. That is a great video. Until next time, play fair and have fun.